Welcome to the workshop, How to Protect Your Skin After Transplant. My name is Marcia, and I will be your moderator for the workshop. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Sylvina Puglisi. Dr. Puglisi is a clinical associate professor of dermatology and attending physician at Stanford Hospitals and Clinics and the Stanford Cancer Institute. She specializes in the management of skin complications associated with chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and bone marrow transplantation with an emphasis on graft versus host disease and survivorship. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Puglisi. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, Marsha, for that kind introduction. My name is Lavina Puglisi, and I'm really thrilled to have been invited here today. And I'm going to talk about um, all the different ways that we can protect our skin after transplant and some specific uh, diagnoses to look out for. So without further ado, um, I'll start with my learning object objectives. First, um, I will review some common skin conditions that can arise post-transplant. Some of the things I'll discuss today are going to be dry skin and lips, itchy skin, skin bruising, and acne. I'll talk about how to recognize skin wounds and also skin infections, emphasizing bacterial, fungal, and viral skin infections. I'll go over drug rashes, including some of the common things we can see with drug rashes, and also emphasizing some findings that we can see in life-threatening drug rashes. I'll review hair and nail changes post-transplant, and finally, speak on how to recognize skin cancer and, under, and making sure everyone understands the role of sun protection, including sunscreen, and skin cancer prevention. First up is dry skin. Now, this is something that is incredibly common. There are a number of different causes for dry skin. There's certainly a genetic component, and there could be some skin conditions that are linked with dry skin. So these are common things like eczema, for example. Some patients just have more sensitive skin that can be dry. Certain medications can dry your skin, and that's a big question that we, um, that we talk about, um, that we ask patients about. Also, uh, beauty products. Uh, there are certain topics, um, topical medications like topical retinols uh, that can cause drying of the skin, uh, different face washes and things of the sort that can dry the skin out as well. There's some environmental factors uh, so, for example, um, if you live in a very dry climate, if you run your heat really high indoors, all of that can contribute to dry skin. And there are some habits, so some things that sometimes feel good, like taking long, um, hot showers, uh, that can dry out our skin as well. To treat dry skin, some of the things we recommend are modifying our habits. So, for example, when you're showering, taking a bath, or washing your hands, Use um, lukewarm water, not hot water. When you are showering or taking a bath, try to keep it short, you know, five minutes or so. If you're doing what we call any kind of wet work, you know, washing dishes, laundry, things like that, where you're submerging your hands in water, can be helpful to wear gloves. They have some gloves that are waterproof and the inside is lined with cotton, so it also feels nice on your skin. Um, and that can be helpful to avoid the irritant quality of the water on your skin. We ask that you avoid harsh soaps on your skin, also things that have heavy fragrances in them. And of course, dermatologists love moisturizers. Uh, we think that the cream-based moisturizers work better than lotions. Um, they're a bit more occlusive. They absorb better into the skin. And um, they're usually the ones that come in the jars that you see in, in, the, um, in the stores as opposed to the ones, you know, the pump bottles that you can get. And if your skin is really dry, it can help to use moisturizers with some white cotton gloves. We call them like white cotton spa gloves over your skin. That helps to um, improve the absorption of the moisturizer into your hands. Along the same vein as dry skin um, are dry lips. Now, this is very bothersome, uh, and there can be a number of causes for dry lips. One very common cause that we see is licking your lips. So, of course, if you have dry lips, as you know, it can be really hard not to lick them. However, this can cause worsening of the dry lips and even cause a rash around your mouth. There's something called contact allergies. This is how we see a skin allergy show up. Basically, it's a rash and it's over your lips and it can be very dry. In some cases, the growth of bacteria on the lips uh, can cause dryness. The, cause of the growth of yeast on the lips can cause dryness. 
So sometimes your doctor might take some swabs to try to figure out if that's what's going on. Now, chronic sun exposure can lead to changes on the lower lip primarily that can mimic dryness of the lips. Very important, you know, the lower lip is exposed to more sun usually than the upper lip. And it's the place that we sometimes don't think about protecting from the sun. And then one of the manifestations of graft versus host disease can sometimes be dry lips. Now, generally, you know, dry lips in isolation, we're really not going to be too worried about that. But sometimes if we have lip changes plus some inside the mouth changes and also skin changes, we might think a little bit more about that diagnosis. For dry lips, we're seeing a couple of, for treatments and prevention, you know, again, some of these modifiable habits. So avoid licking your lips when able. Um, we do like to use petroleum jelly on, on the lips. Um, it's very moisturizing, also doesn't have um, any allergens in it unless you happen to be allergic to petroleum jelly, which is rare, but possible. Um, some people actually can be very sensitive to the mint and cinnamon um, kind of flavors that are present in certain toothpaste, actually most of them, um, and mouthwashes as well. So if you, um, you know, find that you're kind of having persistent dry lips, one option is to change from those products to see if you have improvement. Because we know that sun can play a role, it can be helpful to use a lip balm. Generally, we'll talk more later this talk about sun protection factor and what to use in terms of sunscreen, but our recommendation is going to be a sun protection factor, SPF, of at least 30. And of course, we have to balance the use of this with the risk of maybe being allergic to an ingredient. And so it is a little bit of a, a nuanced trial sometimes. And then again, because there are so many different causes for dry lips, your doctor might prescribe medications like topical antibiotics, topical antifungals, or topical steroids. So when I say topical, you know these are all going to be creams, lotions, et cetera. Now, one of the um, side effects sometimes of dry skin is itchy skin. It's actually itchy skin is one of the main complaints um, patients can have. As anyone who's had itchy skin knows that it can be incredibly uncomfortable and can really cause a lot of issues with things like concentration, so, you know, just focusing on daily tasks, and of course, things like sleeping. Now, I talked about dry skin being one of the main factors. We can also have itchy skin if we have any allergies. And these could be allergies, you know, independent of skin allergies, just like environmental allergies. Certain skin conditions, things like eczema, psoriasis, those can all cause itchy skin. Again, medications. Medications could cause itch without any kind of rash. Certain medical conditions, so commonly things like thyroid disease, um, any kidney issues, having some liver abnormalities um, or liver disease, those things could all cause itchy skin. And then there are some conditions that affect primarily the nerves, and one manifestation of that is itchy skin. So treating itchy skin, well, you, by now you know that dermatologists love both moisturizers and sunscreens, so we do always start with dry skin care. We want to make sure the skin barrier is as healthy as possible um, to help reduce the risk of the skin becoming dry, itchy, et cetera. Some over-the-counter options for itchy skin are um, a camphor menthol lotion or a permoxine lotion. These are all topical anti-itch medications. For some patients, if we're thinking that there might be an allergic component or if the um, itch is so severe that it's getting in the way of kind of daily activities and sleeping, we might use combination oral antihistamines or we might use um, different medications that help with itch, medications you might have heard of like gabapentin or pregabalin. And then again, because there are so many underlying causes to itchy skin, we want to make sure it's not related to anything else internal. So your doctor may order some labs to look for a, an underlying cause. And then additional treatments are definitely available. It often depends on, you know, um, if we identify a particular cause and how severe the itch is, and also, of course, interactions with medications and things of the sort. Another skin issue that comes up very often in my post-transplant patient is skin bruising. You know, skin bruising is not only, you know, can be sometimes tender and painful, but a lot of my patients just don't like having the bruises on their arms, which makes a lot of sense. Now, there are some really common general factors that can affect skin bruising. So age, you know, our skin just gets thinner with age. Um, sun exposure, the more sun exposure we have throughout our life, the thinner our skin becomes later on. There's certainly some medications. So 
steroids can thin out the skin, both oral and topical, can sometimes lead to the skin bruising um, specifically. And in the case of blood thinners, you know, it makes it more likely to have the skin bruising appear of the skin. There are also some platelet um, conditions, some blood clotting conditions that can contribute to skin bruising. <clears throat> I do get asked a lot how to reduce uh, bruising. So, you know, there's really, there's not, there aren't tons of easy treatments for the reduction of bruising. Of course, we want to prevent skin bruising as much as possible um, because sometimes we can't prevent some of those things we talked about, like age and prior sun exposure, et cetera. What we really focus on is what can we do now? So certainly, again, moisturizing the skin, um, keeping the skin barrier as healthy as possible can be really helpful. Um, avoiding, you know, injury to the skin. So, think, you know, wearing long sleeves when able, et cetera, can be helpful. Uh, there's some evidence that topical arnica creams, which are generally over-the-counter, um, that these can help uh, with the bruising. And then some patients do try topical retinoids. We use those a lot for things like acne. We use them for anti-aging. Um, and some folks also try them for a reduction in bruising um, on the skin. It can be very drying, so that's sometimes a limiting factor in, in their use. So one of the things I see all the time is acne. And, um, you know, a common myth, I think, is that only teenagers have acne. And, you know, my practice is primarily adult, um, and I see acne as one of the top concerns that patients have. And the, the reason is that acne can be caused by many things. So skin type certainly plays a role. Patients with oily skin are more likely to develop acne. Certain medications can actually flare acne or cause acne in someone that, you know, never had it or had very mild um, acne in the past. So some things we commonly see are topical steroids. Like, for example, you know, someone has a rash on their face and they put on a topical steroid to help with the itch and the rash, and then that causes acne. Or if an oral steroid is prescribed, that can cause acne on the face, on the body. Sometimes certain chemotherapies, targeted therapies, et cetera, can cause acne as well. We know that there's certainly a bacterial cause, like there's some bacteria on the skin that can um, be involved in the formation of acne. Sometimes there is like a yeast, or people will call it like a fungal acne. If that's on our skin, that can also cause acne. And um, little demodex mites that actually live on all of our skin can sometimes be more pronounced in patients that have things like rosacea, for example, or um, with certain immunosuppressive regimens. Um, so we also do see acne related to demodex. And then an external factor that we see is the use of beauty products. So certain beauty products, some of them that are a little bit, like you can think about thicker creams, um, oil-based serums, things of the sort, that can clog up the pores and cause acne as well. So how do we treat acne? Well, you know, it's, it's fairly nuanced. There are a lot of different um, acne products. The first thing I say is that you really don't need, you know, a 15 to 20 step type of uh, facial regimen. In general, having some sort of cleanser that has either glycolic acid, salicylic acid, benzoyl peroxide, those are some, some of our main phase of acne treatment. Um, we do like topical retinoids a lot, and I've mentioned them a few times already, but they can really help with the initial formation of the first kind of whitehead, blackhead on the skin. Um, we know that topical antibiotics um, can be really helpful. These are medications you might have heard of, like clindamycin, et cetera. And then sometimes we use oral antibiotics as well for a limited period of time. This is really just kind of the tip of the iceberg in acne treatment. There are a lot of other treatment options. And I think that certainly if you're kind of struggling with acne, especially acne that's causing scarring, a lot of discoloration, things like that, it will be great to see your doctor, see a dermatologist, and start a treatment regimen that works best for your skin type. Now, I do want to talk a little bit about a diet in acne. This is a question I get asked a lot. You know, are there certain foods that trigger acne or worsen acne? Um, there's a little bit of information out there um, on this. It's a, certainly a very popular topic. But some of the foods that um, can worsen acne in, in many patients, I don't say all because some patients can eat only this diet, not have any acne. But some patients are sensitive to foods that are, have a, what we call a high glycemic index. So that's, um, you know, things that kind of are white carbs, um, uh, uh, foods that's more processed sweets, et cetera, um, that can all worsen acne in certain patients, a high sugar content. Um, 
skim milk has been shown to be implicated in certain studies, and then there was uh, some information on, on chocolate as well. But again, this is not true for everybody. I have some patients that, again, need only these foods and don't have any acne, um, so it really is very variable. But if you feel like when you eat these foods or acne flares, I think it's very reasonable to, you know, try avoidance and see if you get improvement. And um, the things that we note can help acne are probiotics and also actually omega-3 fatty acids. So there is a role for some of these you know, probiotics and supplements in prevention of acne or in treating acne here. And some of this um, in terms of diet is also true when we talk about rosacea. Okay, so switching gears completely from acne to skin wounds. So two totally different diagnoses that we can see on the skin. Now, we do know that some areas um, are just more likely to form wounds. You know, areas that have worse circulation, so the feet and the legs, and most people are going to have worse circulation than, you know, like the chest of the body. Um, swelling of the legs, which is kind of closely tied to issues of the circulation, and sometimes can be really tied to medications as well. And some medications specifically, so medications that suppress your immune system, for example, um, can get in the way of wound healing. We know that patients who have graft versus host disease of the skin um, can be at greater risk for wounds, in particular with certain variants. Um, you guys have heard a little bit this morning about chronic graft versus host disease, um, some forms of that on the skin that cause to kind of a tight, cause a tightening of the skin, make the skin more fragile, um, can predispose to certain skin wounds. Um, some skin conditions. Um, can also predispose to skin wounds. So I'm thinking about things like eczema, where the skin barrier is impaired, um, but also uh, more serious skin conditions or rashes where you kind of get these open sores on the skin or even sometimes ulcers. Uh, and then nutritional deficiencies can also play a role. So sometimes, you know, as you're going through uh, the process of having a bone marrow transplant, and in the hospital and getting medications that affect the gut and maybe having GVHD affecting the gut, all of that can lead to, A, you know, ingesting less food and also absorbing less nutrients. Uh, so we do want to be on the lookout for that and the appropriate patient um, check certain labs looking for nutritional deficiencies. And because one of my main jobs as a dermatologist is screening for skin cancer, I do always want to keep a close eye on wounds and wounds that are not healing as expected. And remember, the wounds are going to take longer to heal than we would expect if some of these variables are in play. But wounds that don't heal the way that they should, we should check them for skin cancer, generally with a skin biopsy. And we'll talk a little bit more about skin cancer in a few minutes. Okay. So skin infections, there are some really common skin infections that we can see. And I'm going to talk about some of the most common ones that we see in clinic. So um, we'll just, instead of going through this list, I'll just hop right into chatting about them. The first one is a very superficial bacterial infection that we call impetigo. Now, this is contagious, and one of the characteristic skin findings that we see is this kind of yellow or what we call honey-colored crust. We just love to compare skin to food, you know, skin rashes to food in dermatology. So honey-colored crust on the skin. Diagnosis um, is fairly straightforward. We generally will do a wound culture. So we take, you know, a little Q-tip um, specimen, we rub it against the skin, and we put it, we, we send it to the lab to see whether any bacteria is growing there. Uh, and generally, this can be treated sometimes with topical antibiotics, and in certain cases, we'll use oral antibiotics. Another really common rash, and one that maybe you've had or heard about, is ringworm. So ringworm is a fungal infection affecting the surface of the skin. It tends to be very round, um, and it ha which is just, that's the ring of the ringworm, um, and it has a bright red border usually. We can also easily um, diagnose this in clinic. We take a little scraping of the skin. We don't cut the skin. We just take a little bit of scale. We look at it as a microscope, and we can see whether there's any fungal forms within that specimen. Um, for this, generally treatment will be either topical antifungals or sometimes we'll need to use oral antifungals. Very closely related to ringworm is nail fungus. So sometimes when we have fungus of, um, affecting the feet, which can be kind of like scale of the feet, uh, we can notice some changes in between the toes. You know, it's not uncommon to then also have the nail affected. Now, fungal infections of the nail are probably some of our 
one of the harder fungal infections to treat because they're really stubborn. And, you know, the creams tend to not penetrate as well into the nail as they do into the skin. But essentially, um, it, you should know that this can affect toenails and fingernails. Um, and that for diagnosing the fungus, we actually take a nail clipping. So we just kind of, you know, cut the nail the way you would just trim your nails. And then we send that off to the lab to identify whether fungus is present and which type is present. Moving on to our most common viral infections, herpes simplex, incredibly common. This shows up generally, it can actually be anywhere, right? We think about it a lot in terms of the lips or genital skin, but we also see it in the buttocks, and we can actually see it really anywhere on the body. So they're going to be these painful and clustered blisters. They love to be in a little group. Um, and again, the diagnosis here can be uh, easily made with a little swab that looks for the virus. Uh, the skin, again, we're not like doing a biopsy, we're just taking a little Q-tip and we're rubbing against the skin and sending off to the lab for, for diagnos but diagnosis. Um, and the treatment for this is generally going to be um, oral antiviral medication. Now, shingles um, is also a viral infection. It's the varicella virus that causes chicken pox. And what happens with um, shingles is that this virus, like after you've had chicken pox or chicken pox vaccine, will kind of lay dormant and quiescent. And then generally during times of stress, and that could be a life stressor, or it could be also a medical stressor, like being immunosuppressed, for example, um, what will happen is that you'll get these clustered blisters, but they're in a line. It's a little bit different than, you know, what we saw with herpes simplex. These tend to be in a very painful line on the skin, small little blisters. Those are generally also treated. This diagnosis is also treated with oral antiviral medication. And then continuing on with our viral theme, a uh, completely different virus that we call human papillomavirus, HPV, which you might have heard a lot about. HPV is a virus that causes warts. It's incredibly common. There are all different strains of HPV. Specific strains are associated with warts in certain areas. Like one type will be warts on the hands and the feet, and we might have certain types that are associated more with genital warts. And then we also have high-risk HPV variants that are sometimes linked to skin cancer. And that can definitely be scary, but just know that most warts are, are not cancerous, but we definitely want to evaluate warts or acting kind of weird. Um, so what's, what you need to know is that patients who are on immunosuppression can develop many warts. And that's because in general, kind of the immune surveillance, obviously, that keeps these warts in check is a little bit lower than usual on immunosuppression. So more of these warts are allowed to grow on the skin. And for treatment, we do a number of different things. So we can do liquid nitrogen. That's that like freezing treatment if you ever had that done before. That's done in the office. Uh, we can prescribe different topical medications. We can do different injections into the skin of different things. Um, sometimes we'll inject candida or we'll inject sodofavir, which is a, an antiviral. So there's a lot that can be done for warts. Sometimes we do laser procedures. So just something to keep in mind. Um, that the wards can be a little bit more challenging to treat in patients, you know, post-transplants who are immunosuppressed because they might have more of them. And now all of those skin infections generally, of course, we want to diagnose them, we want to treat them promptly, we want to look for any um, atypical signs um, that could be more serious. But I also just want to emphasize that because of the um, sometimes chemotherapy, sometimes medications used after transplant to suppress the immune system, um, patients post-transplant can be at increased risk of more serious and less common skin infections. Um, these can be caused by bacteria, fungi, and also viruses. So not that you need to diagnose it on your own, but just be aware if you have any skin bumps, rashes, anything that just feels different on your skin, especially if you have symptoms like fever, or you feel unwell, or there's anything else that's untoward. Um, we're always happy to help diagnose these conditions, and our goal is to get the most prompt treatment possible. Now, drug rashes, similar to infections, is something where we sort of have the common things that we identify and treat very readily, and then we want to be aware of some of the symptoms that would be a sign of more serious drug rashes. So a very common type of drug rash that we see, we call it morbilliform, which actually just means measles-like. Hopefully you haven't seen measles or had measles, but measles can look like these sort of pink red bumps that kind of all um, melt together and become this pink red rash all over the body. 
um, it's rarely itchy, so it's usually itchy, very itchy, and it tends to start one to two weeks after a new medication, the only caveat being that if you've had the medication before, you could get this rash much sooner than usual. And generally, we can treat this with different topical and oral medications. In some cases, we stop the medication. If it's a medication that's needed, like very important, we can't stop it, we'll treat through the rash because it's not a life-threatening rash. It just can be quality of life-threatening and that it's very itchy and, and it's all redness all over the body. Now, what I want you to know is that there can be some more serious drug rashes, and some drug rashes can even be life-threatening. So if you have any symptoms like hives, so that's like, you know, red welts on the skin, that and you're also having some um, swelling of the lips, of the tongue, and trouble breathing, like feeling like your throat's closing. That's going to be an, an emergency, like go to the emergency room emergency. If you're noticing something strange, like you have a rash on the body that looks like what we just saw, but you have um, also swelling of the face or redness of the face, you have fever, we also want to make sure that's looked at very quickly. And then painful skin is a big red flag in dermatology, like painful skin with blisters, skin peeling off, sores in the mouth and genitals, just has to be evaluated very quickly because there can be some really serious drug rashes associated with those findings. Now I'm going to move on to hair loss, which is obviously could be probably its own talk in and of itself. Hair loss is such a common concern for patients coming into dermatology. The term we use for hair loss is alopecia. Now, there are two main types of hair loss um, that we think about, you know, two main categories. Scarring hair loss, meaning that the hair follicles scar down, the hair is not going to grow back, and then non-scarring hair loss. The types of non-scarring hair loss, you know, this is a bucket, but there are a lot of different types within non-scarring hair loss. There's the sort of classic chemotherapy-related, what we call antigen effluvium, all the hair shedding or most of the hair shedding. There is something called telogen effluvium. This is a stress-related kind of hair loss. This is the kind of hair loss that we see now after, for example, COVID infection or like a hospitalization or what you might see post-pregnancy, where a few months after some sort of stressful trigger, many of the hairs on the scalp will shed. It's not complete hair shedding, but it's definitely a lot more hair than usual. We have different a different variant of non-scarring hair loss called alopecia areata. That's that picture that you're seeing with just like the round area of hair loss. This is the immune system um, attacking the hair follicle. And then we also have our classic, what we call antigenetic alopecia or male, and, male or female pattern hair loss. And this is um, how we lose hair generally as we age, sometimes due to certain medications. The difference between non-scarring and scarring hair loss is that usually a scarring type of hair loss will have some kind of symptom. So a patient might have a rash, they might notice some scale, they might have some redness of the skin, they might have an itchy scalp. And you sometimes see a bit of a shiny scalp if you look at it, you know, areas where you're not seeing the hair follicles there anymore. This is a kind of, there are a lot of reasons for this, a lot of different conditions, but this is what we might see with, you know, prior to radiation to the scalp or um, for patients who have graft versus host disease. For hair loss interventions, um, it is very variable, again, kind of depending on the diagnosis of what we do, but in most cases, we'll check some labs. Um, we know that thyroid conditions, low vitamin D, and a low iron can all cause hair loss. Um, we sometimes will obtain a biopsy or a sample of the scalp. Um, this is most helpful when we're thinking about scarring hair loss and trying to distinguish between different types of scarring hair loss. Um, and uh, we might there are a lot of medications we can use. Um, topical minoxidil or brand name Rogaine uh, is a very common medication we use for hair loss, um, but sometimes we use different oral medications or recommend different supplements, of course, depending on what we find during the initial visit. Now, there are a lot of supplements for hair loss out there. This is a huge market. Um, it's very lucrative. Nobody wants to lose their hair. Um, so it's a place where, unfortunately, I think there can be a lot of products that just aren't that good that are being, um, they're being sold for a lot of money. Um, biotin is the most popular hair loss supplement. And in recent years, it has not been shown to help hair regrowth um, in the vast majority of patients, but it's still present in many over-the-counter supplements. Um, I usually would just caution against it because it can interfere with certain lab tests. Um, one of the main ones being a thyroid test, a TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. 
Um, and I tend to not really recommend supplements unless there's a true deficiency. So we talked a little bit about nutritional deficiency with wounds. We can see sometimes nutritional deficiency with hair loss. So if someone has risk factors, I might check some labs specifically um, and then supplement for those uh, vitamins or minerals. But in general, I don't recommend as a blanket recommendation that everybody start a hair loss supplement. And the other um, part of the body that we see as dermatologists, we talked about a little about skin, about the hair, and also nails. You know, nails are within the purview of dermatology. There's a whole field of nail dermatology. I'm not really going to do its service by giving one slide on this topic, but I do want to talk about the most common um, thing that I see, which is weakening of the nails or brittle nails. Um, many times is externally, um, cause externally. So hot water, again, having dry skin, having a dry cuticle, um, kind of that U-shaped area, you know, at the kind of end of your nail, um, picking at the nail, sometimes different irritants like cleaning agents, et cetera. Again, medications and certain medical conditions can all weaken the nail. So we will, again, for treatment, we'll pull out our dry skincare recommendations that we talked about earlier. We try to avoid irritants. That's really also where the gloves that we talked about for wet work come in. We're doing the, you know, Vaseline or other cream-based or a cream-based moisturizer with a white cotton spa gloves where that can be helpful for the nails as well. And this is one place where we do use biotin. Um, biotin at 2,500 micrograms per day can help to strengthen the nail. Again, just making sure that if you're having any labs checked, you're letting your doctor know you're on biotin so they can just tell you to stop it before getting your labs drawn. And then sometimes we use certain nail hardeners, and there are some over-the-counter ones. There also are some prescription ones. So with the remaining time that I have today, I'd like to discuss two big um, topics. One of them is skin cancer, and the second is, you know, what we can do to prevent skin cancer. So um, we do know that patients who have undergone bone marrow transplants are at increased risk for skin cancer. Now, the incidence or how often this occurs does vary by study. Um, I pulled out just two numbers here, but the 20-year cumulative incidence um, in one study was noted to be six and a half for basal cell skin cancer and 3.4% for squamous cell skin cancer. And another study had shown a two to four times increased risk compared to non-transplant patients. There are some risk factors that we kind of see across the board this is for all patients, even you know, without transplant. So we know that UV exposure is, like UV is a known carcinogen. It's been very closely linked to skin cancer. So there are different ways of getting sun. So some people tend to get more intermittent sunburns when summertime comes around, when they're on vacation, et cetera. And other people, so people like me who live in California, you know, have a little bit more chronic exposure in the sense that when the weather is nice all the time, you're getting kind of more of that direct UV exposure. Certainly, patients who have lighter skin um, are at increased risk for skin cancer. Certain medications can make you more photosensitive or increase your risk of skin cancer. So medications like azathioprine, medications like voriconazole, these can all increase um, skin cancers. Having a history of radiation can also increase your risk of skin cancer. Scars and chronic wounds, there are certain types of skin cancers that can occur in those two areas. Um, again, linking back to the sun exposure, working outdoors. Uh, genetics also play a role. There are def definitely some genetic predisposition to developing skin cancer. And smoking, when we think about skin cancers that affect, you know, the mouth, the lips, et cetera. Now, some transplant-specific skin risk factors for developing skin cancer um, are sometimes the same and slightly a little different for basal cell and squamous cell cancer. And we'll go over these skin cancers in just a few seconds. But basal cell skin cancer um, has been shown to be more likely in patients with the primary diagnosis of leukemia, lymphoma, or a malignant narrow disease. Younger age of transplant also increases the risk, and having chronic graft host disease also seems to increase the risk of basal cell skin cancer. You see here the use of azathioprine um, can also be linked to basal cell cancer and being on medication to suppress the immune system for more than two years. For squamous cell cancer, we're seeing some also common um, things that we just talked about, but diagnosis of leukemia, also here severe plastic anemia was noted, the younger age of transplant, radiation, um, total body radiation here makes the list, and then again we're seeing chronic graft versus host disease. 
what do these skin cancers look like? Basal cell skin cancer is going to be a pink, uh, red, shiny bump. It can be scaly. And on darker skin, it can be purple or blue. Gray mast cell cancer can be pink, red, purple. It can be scaly. It can look like a sore or a wound that does not heal. Um, it can also be a scar. Again, we talked a little bit about this, but a scar that has some sort of new um, symptom associated with it. And it can also be uh, very painful. So we're always going to ask about how do these things feel. And pain is a big red flag. Melanoma is the most common skin cancer. It's uh, generally going to be an irregular brown or black growth. It can be pink sometimes or red. And one thing I always talk about is the ugly duckling sign. So we're always going to be looking out for th that mole, that spot on the skin that looks different than other spots in the skin that you have. That's going to be a big red flag for us as well. I do want to emphasize that skin cancer, you know, can affect all skin types. We do know, unfortunately, that skin cancers can be diagnosed later and have a more aggressive, um, more aggressive features at time of diagnosis in patients with skin of color. And we know that for patients with skin of color, UV exposure seems to play a less role, like a smaller role. Um, so we see squamous cell cancer presenting, it's 8.5 more times more likely to present in areas that are not exposed to the sun in skin of color patients and melanomas as well. And that's why we hear a lot about melanomas occurring uh, you know, on the palms and the soles in patients with skin of color. And some specific risk factors in skin of color patients are radiation, immunosuppression, prior burns, chronic scars, and also chronic ulcers. The treatment for skin cancer really depends on the skin cancer and subtype. So it is a conversation to have with your dermatologist. But depending on the type that it is, it can be treated from anything from just a topical chemotherapy cream to a more advanced surgery. These are outpatient surgeries in general, and most micrographic surgery is the most specialized type of surgery that we have for treatment of skin cancer. Um, it is less common, but still occurs, that we can have advanced skin cancers that need radiation um, and systemic treatment as well, like chemotherapy or immunotherapy. There's generally no, um, you know, general, there's no guideline or general, like, um, recommendation for how often to have your skin screen post-transplant, we tend to recommend at least annual screenings. And of course, if you have more risk factors or you have a, a spot of concern, um, I would please advocate to be seen sooner because, um, again, we don't want any skin cancers going undiagnosed and untreated. Skin checks are pretty straightforward. Um, for a skin check, you'll come into dermatology clinic, you'll remove all your clothing, um, You'll have put a gown on, we'll check from your head to your toes, and then we use a little device uh, instrument called dermatoscope to sort of zoom in and magnify certain features. And if we need to, we'll obtain a um, skin biopsy. And finally, I just want to emphasize, you know, the one um, modifiable factor that we have that we can uh, do to protect skin cancer is sun protection. And I want to emphasize that it's more than just sunscreen. So it's just Things like seeking shade, avoiding the peak sun hours, wearing a hat, and wearing UPF clothing, which sort of has like the built-in sun protection in it. Um, when we look at sunscreens, what the sun protection factor is telling us is essentially how much longer you could be outdoors in the sun before turning red than if you did not have that on. But unfortunately, the big caveat here is that you have to put on enough sunscreen to reach that level of protection, and that's generally about 1.5 ounces. It's a lot of sunscreen. Um, and you have to reapply because sunscreen does not last more than two hours. So it's really important to just keep those things in mind when we think about SPF. There are two main families of sunscreens. There's our physical blockers and our chemical blockers. So the main distinction is that physical blockers sit on your skin and they scatter the UV, whereas chemical blockers absorb into the skin. Um, and this can have some pros and cons. So the because the physical blockers tend to sit on your skin more than absorb, they can leave more of a white residue. And the chemical blockers absorb well into the skin, but I think sometimes um, there can be some concerns, um, well, A, of course, about coral reefs and bleaching of the coral reefs. But I do have some patients that don't really want to put a lot of chemicals on their skin and have it absorb. So my recommendation with choosing a sunscreen, the best sunscreen is the one that you'll wear. Look for something broad spectrum with UVA and UVB, and look for at least SPF 30, choosing a little bit higher, thinking about, you know, just how imperfect we are as humans with application. Remember that sunscreen can prevent skin cancer and prevent, um, prevent aging, help against being sensitive to certain 
uh, with certain medications that make you more sensitive to the sun, it can help to you know, prevent that from happening and also curtail flares of graft or host disease related to sun exposure. And I do always get asked, is sunscreen safe? It can sometimes cause minor skin irritation. You know, allergies to sunscreen are rare, but can occur. And what I always say is if you have concerns about the ingredients in sunscreen, the great option that we have is we have UPF clothing to protect most of your body, and we can always have you use one of those physical blockers. But at the end of the day, we do know that uh, UV exposure causes skin cancer, so we want to make sure that you're not most of the time unprotected outdoors. And finally, for my patients who are concerned about vitamin D deficiency, I do tend to recommend vitamin D via diet and supplements. Here are some dietary sources that can be helpful as well. And we do partner really closely with primary care and oncology to make sure that our sun protection um, recommendations are not getting in the way of adequate vitamin D protection. In the interest of time, I'll leave the take-home points here um, for, for you to read, but I hope that I've given you a good review of some of the most common um, skin concerns that happen post-transplant, that you have a better understanding of some of the infections, drug rashes, effects on hair and nails, and importantly, skin cancer post-transplant and sun avoidance and protection. Thank you so much for your time and the opportunity to be here today. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Puglisi, for this excellent presentation. We'll now begin the question and answer session. If you have any questions for Dr. Puglisi, please use the chat box on the left side of the screen to submit your questions. We will answer as many questions as possible. The first person would like to know, how can immunoglobulin infusions impact skin condition? Thank you for that question. I think that it depends um, on kind of the, the skin condition involved. We do use um, immunoglobulin and then for treatment of some skin conditions. Um, and then we sometimes see some reaction to it. So it would depend on the type of skin condition that's being treated. Okay, the next question is, my skin is more fragile after an unrelated donor transplant with bruising and skin tears. Does the skin ever return to its original condition or healthy state? Thank you for asking, that's an excellent question. Um, so the skin, in general, our skin will not go back to the way that it was, and this is just with age, sun exposure, and then also, of course, in the case of transplant. Um, we can do some things to improve um, the fragility of skin. You know, the most important thing here would be moisturizing the skin to protect that skin barrier externally, um, trying to avoid, even though I know the injury that causes the tears are so minor, you know, trying to do some things like wearing a long sleeve, et cetera, can be helpful with trying to avoid those tears. But the most important thing I would say would be a lot of moisturizing. Um, and then, of course, you can talk to your doctor about whether there might be a role for using um, different medications like arnica, topical arnica uh, to help with the skin bruising itself. Okay, how, how do you know the difference between chemotherapy-induced skin conditions opposed to GVHD of the skin? This is such a good question, and it can actually be a whole lecture. Um, so I'm, I'm happy that you asked this. I'll tell you that it can be challenging, and I think the most challenging time is a direct, you know, sort of post-transplant period where, you, where patients have usually received chemotherapy um, prior to the transplant, and then, um, you know, are, are hoping grafting, and that's when we start worrying about graft and host disease, and all of that happens in such a short time frame that it really can be very difficult in the beginning to parse out the differences. Um, this is something that actually people have looked at because it, again, is a big challenge. And when you're seeing a patient in the hospital, like we do post-transplant, and, you know, of course, after transplant, one of the main concerns beyond engrafting is graft versus host disease. You know, it can be really um, serious to tell somebody, I think you have graft versus host disease of the skin. So we try to use some clinical features first. So what does that mean? So many of the chemotherapy regimens, and of course it just depends on what the, the preparatory regimen is, but we know that many chemotherapy regimens that are used during that time can cause a classic rash that we call toxic erythema of chemotherapy. 
this tends to affect kind of like the armpits, the folds of the body, you know, armpits, groin folds, under the belly, et cetera, and is a little bit less likely to have rash in other areas of the body. Now, that's not a perfect um, you know, the, the, all the rashes don't read the textbook, so it's not perfect. But if we're seeing primarily that pattern, sores in the mouth, et cetera, um, and we're not seeing um, more of that widespread pink rash that we see for acute graft versus host disease, we can feel a little more confident that it might be chemotherapy <clears throat> and not GVHD. Unfortunately, both GVHD and toxic graphene of chemotherapy can affect the palms and the soles, so that's a place where we don't really have that much information. And then I also want to note that there are other rashes that pop up during this time that are not GVHD, which just complicates the picture. One of the things we do a lot um, here is that we follow patients really closely in the hospital. So we want to make sure that if someone develops a rash, we see what it's doing every day. And eventually, toxic therapy of chemotherapy, you know, should improve, which some of our more, um, I'll say, kind of mild treatment modalities. But yeah, I think it can be really challenging. And it's a place where skin biopsy doesn't help all that much. So that can also make things difficult. Okay, we have a couple people asking specifically about rosacea. And so I'm going to combine the two questions. First person would like to know if you have any advice for treating worsening rosacea, either vascular and inflammatory, that develop post-transplant. And another person is asking, can a probiotic supplement help with the rosacea? Perfect. Well, I'll start with the, with the second one. Uh, probiotic supplements have been shown to be helpful for rosacea, similar to acne. So that's, that's yes, it can. Um, for the first question, talking about treatments for rosacea. So um, great question because you also hit on there being many different types of rosacea. So there's the flushing type of rosacea where we have mostly um, pink or redness of the skin of the face that first comes and goes, and then later on can be more fixed on the skin. So you're always feeling kind of red and flushed. Sometimes we can have like a burning sensation that goes along with that. Then we have our more acne-like rosacea. We actually get acne bumps. So the treatment, um, and then we have different variants of rosacea, but just in the interest of time, I won't go into those. Those are the two most common. For um, the treatments are different. So for the acne-like rosacea, we do many similar things that we do for acne. We use topical antibiotics, a common one being metronidazole. We use different topical medications like azelaic acid. We use medications against uh, Demodex, which we know is implicated or plays a role in rosacea. So that's ivermectin. We often will use a cream, ivermectin cream, or we sometimes use an oral ivermectin for treatment. And then in cases that are really challenging to treat with those and other topical medications, we will do oral medications. So one thing we do quite often is an oral antibiotic. There's one called doxycycline that we tend to use, not infrequently because it's very good for rosacea. And some patients that have really severe rosacea that doesn't respond to anything, again, more like the acne-like rosacea, will do isotretinoin or Accutane. We can do that as a low-dose medication. So those are some treatments, not a full comprehensive list, but some treatments for that more acne-like rosacea. For the pink type of rosacea, the more blood vessel ones, there are some topical medications that can help with redness. They tend to, their prescription, they tend to, the two ones that I'm thinking about are um, oxymetazolin, which is Rophase, and then there's one called Merveso, that's the brand name. Uh, these medications you put onto the skin and they temporarily help the redness, but the redness will come back. So there's like an immediate rebound effect in a few hours. Um, and then I think one of a really great treatment for the redness in rosacea is actually laser treatment. Now, I don't do any cosmetics, but um, my lovely colleagues here will often help out with my patients that have um, that more flushing vascular type of rosacea um, because really the topicals can sometimes have a little bit of a limited role in how much they help. What is the most common problem you encounter with CAR T cell recipients? Great question. Um, we see uh, some of the things that we talked about, um, you know, dry skin is really common, and we see different types of rashes um, in CAR T cell recipients. So often, um, you know, our first goal is kind of checking the entire body, seeing what the patient's main concern is in terms of dryness or rash, and then if it's a rash, trying to better 
um, identify what type of rash it is so that we can treat it appropriately. How do you check for nutritional deficiencies? That's a really good question. So first, it's, um, you know, identifying the right patient. You know, um, I don't, it's not a test that we tend to do kind of across the board, but if someone does have, uh, if we have cause for concern, again, so someone that has lost a lot of weight, isn't eating as much, is, um, you know, has a limited type of food that they're taking in, uh, or again, has a lot of diarrhea, uh, that leads to um, problems with absorption, or if there are medications that get in the way of absorption, as sometimes certain chemotherapy does, then we'll check. But the check itself is very easy. It's just, in general, just laboratory work, so it's a blood draw. Um, so we would just kind of order certain labs, um, so they're, you know, vitamin B, different, different B vitamins, vitamin C, we'll look for iron, vitamin D, et cetera. Uh, and then once we get all the results back, we'll discuss them with the patients. And if there are any deficiencies, then we'll talk about how to supplement them with over-the-counter supplementation. Okay, the next question says, what about immunity-related fungal dark spots on the face that look like age spots? Hmm, that's a good question. Immediate related fungal age spots. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure what um, what exactly the diagnosis. There are um, there's something that we call um, tinea versicolor that is kind of a, a yeast related rash uh, that we can see um, sometimes, and that can have a bit of like a dark scaly appearance. And it can be it's really common on the chest and the back, but we certainly can get it in other areas as well. Um, and that is something that we'll treat with topical antifungal shampoos or creams and sometimes oral medications. And so if that's the diagnosis, we're not the treatment for it. But I'm, I'm not sure if there might be another thing that I'm not quite, quite getting diagnosis for. Okay. Someone would like to know um, what your preferred oral antibiotics for a BMT patient with acne, if you have a preferred antibi oral antibiotic. Suggestion. That's a good question. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think it depends on, you know, it's certainly very dermatologist specific, the antibiotics that we might be more likely to use. Um, I tend to generally, unless there's um, any reason not to, like an allergy, or if a patient has like an, I know, another medication that might interact, um, et cetera, I will usually will use doxycycline as, as my main one. And the, there are a couple of reasons for that. There are some side effects like second, that you do need to know about, so it can cause stomach upset. That can be a really serious side effect. It's more common to happen if you take it on an empty stomach, so I do recommend taking it with food. There can be some lower absorption taking it with dairy products, um, but you certainly don't want to take it on an empty stomach because it can feel really nauseous. Um, now, the second thing is that it can make you very sensitive to the sun, and that is often problematic in California because the weather is quite nice. So you have to sort of make sure, you know, be really realistic about the sun exposure of the patient that you're prescribing it for. And it can cause some reflux sometimes. Um, so like an acid reflux, um, it's important not to lay down after taking it. And then if someone already obviously has acid reflux or ulcers or anything like that, you really don't want to use it. So, but even though that sounds like a really extensive um, a side effect list uh, compared to some of the other antibiotics that we use, it's actually one of the shorter ones. So I tend to go for that first, but I do want to emphasize that antibiotics are not, you know, a long-term fix. So we do use them longer than we might use them for infection. You know, for infection, you might be an antibiotic like a week or two weeks, right? For acne, we'll do sometimes, you know, one to three month courses of antibiotics. So it's not short, but we certainly don't want to do it for many months you know, year plus, just because how the antibiotics can affect the gut and all the other side effects that can occur. Um, but my personal, I guess, and only my favorite, but the one antibiotic I tend to use probably the most is doxycycline. Okay, someone is concerned about their, um, since they've had their transplant, they've been more affected by insect bites. And they said that they get swelling and sometimes the skin forms quite large blisters. Have you ever heard of this and do you have any suggestions? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, so some patients can, um, some patients without transplant can be really sensitive to insect bites and we sometimes can have it happen post-transplant as well. Um, there's not, you know, there's, 
the prevention methods are, of course, trying to wear like long sleeve clothing, um, protecting yourself from insects when able to, and then insect repellent in some cases can also be helpful. And there are a lot of different types, and of course, a whole discussion about more natural ones and more chemical ones and whatnot. So that's the pre the main prevention piece. When a when you do get an insect bite. Um, usually what we want to do is just stop the itch because um, when we start scratching it, we just get more rash and that we can get, you know, scarring and things like that. So what I usually would recommend for that is a topical steroid medication. Um, you could certainly start with over-the-counter hydrocortisone. It's a little bit weak sometimes, so you might want to get something a little bit stronger from your doctor, just meaning that if you put it on, you just have to use it for less days, you know, as you might need to use a hydrocortisone. And then for patients that are really itchy, because these bug bites can be really itchy, we'll use antihistamines. Okay, the next person asks, post-transplant, post I have chronic skin GVHD. My skin is almost exquisitely sensitive to heat. Hot water, certainly, but even if I very briefly stand in the sun with sunscreen, it feels like my skin is literally burning as soon as the ray of sun hits it. It gets very hot and painful almost immediately. What is the mechanism for this? Thank you. That's a really good question. Um, so there can be a number of things causing that. And of course, we want to take into account chronic graphic host disease. But I also say, you know, we don't want to um, always assume everything's related to one thing. We want to keep that in mind, but make sure we're not missing anything else. So one would, of course, is be like medications. So um, whether um, the person asking the question is on any medications that can make them sensitive to the sun, that could be one reason why that really severe response is happening. A second thing is, um, whether there could be a separate skin condition. You know, we often will see graphic hosts of the skin and then something else. Um, so because of that reason, we do want to make sure that we're not thinking about other conditions that can affect the skin. So there are certain skin conditions uh, that are triggered by sun exposure. So it would be helpful to just, you know, talk to your doctor about it and see whether they're concerned about that or whether, you know, they think it could be a medication or whether it could just be the graphic host host disease. Okay, this is going to have to be our last question since we are running out of time. Someone would like to know if sun exposure has been identified as a trigger for GVHD flares, but can just plain heat also be a trigger? That's a really good question. So we know for sure that um, that sun exposure, the UV exposure, um, can flare GVHD. I am not personally aware about just heat as a trigger, but as I mean, it doesn't exist, but just not something that I'm knowledgeable on. But thank you for asking that. On behalf of BMT InfoNet and our partners, I'd like to thank Dr. Puglisi for a very helpful presentation, and thank you, the audience, for your excellent questions. Please contact BMT InfoNet if we can help you in any way. Enjoy the rest of the symposium. <laughs>